Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I would like to give you a short lecture on the gross pathology of the nervous system of the pig. And as I do at the beginning of all of these lectures, I want to thank my colleagues who have provided me images either directly or by uploading them to online collections so that I may put these little lectures together for you. Our first image is a common congenital defect of a wide range of species, not just piglets. And because of the lack of fusion of the two sides of the cranium, a pouch which is covered by skin is formed. If it contains only meninges and associated fluids, it would be called a meningocele. And if it contains any of the underlying cerebral or other parts of the brain, then it would be called a meningoencephalocele. Here is an image of a stillborn deformed piglet from Australia, which was infected in utero by a paramyxovirus, which circulates among flying foxes, called the menangovirus. There's only been one outbreak to date of the Menangle virus. That was in Menangle, New South Wales, Australia, which caused significant reproductive losses in swine. Piglets were either stillborn or aborted. Some were mummified. And many had significant defects of the skeletal and the CNS system. You can see that this animal has an overshot maxilla, an abnormally shaped skull, and there is evidence of arthrogryposis, or abnormal bendings of the joints in the hind leg. On cross-section, there's almost nothing here except meninges, a condition which is known as hydranencephaly. And this virus is very unusual because it's the only paramyxovirus I know that can do this. Most of the time that we see this severe type of defect, we're dealing either with pestiviruses or bunyaviruses. As said before, this paramyxovirus comes from bats or flying foxes and was isolated from bat urine and bat feces. But the only abnormalities in this particular outbreak were seen in the piglets. The affected sows did not have any systemic illness. A couple of people were also affected with the menangle virus, but did not have significant illness and mostly just seroconverted. Like other paramyxoviruses, of which the morbili viruses like canine distemper is one, if you took a histologic section of the remaining nervous tissue in this particular animal, you would see cells with intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. Affected animals also had myocarditis, meningitis, and hepatitis. So this is the menangle virus. What an absolutely gorgeous picture of the brain of a pig. And don't be confused by the beautiful blue background and the appearance of hemorrhage. Back up a little bit and you will notice that there is almost nothing left of the cerebellum except for this little nubbin because this is severe cerebellar hypoplasia. And this is associated with in utero infection by porcine pestivirus, the causative agent of classical swine fever, or hog cholera. And pestiviruses have the ability to infect the external granular cell layer of the cerebellum during development. And by doing so, they kill off those cells. Those cells are the progenitors for the nuclei that populate the granular cell layer and also the Purkinje cells. So they don't develop their neurons, which form the granular cell layer, don't develop, and the cerebellum itself is extremely hypoplastic. 
We also see this with other pestiviruses, such as bovine pestivirus, which causes BVD. There's also been reports that this may occur as a result of prenatal hog cholera vaccination in sows. And there is a single report of trichlorphon-induced cerebellar hypoplasia in neonates. Here is the brain of a young pig in which there is hemorrhage which is restricted to the cerebellum. And one of the viruses that we keep saying over and over in multiple systems is that of porcine circovirus type 2. And this is a characteristic cerebellar vasculitis that is induced by the virus which causes apoptosis of endothelial cells and marked edema, hemorrhage, and necrosis of both gray and white matter in the cerebellum. And these affected animals obviously show significant neurologic deficits. It shows signs of two different PCV-related diseases, including post-weaning multisystemic wasting syndrome, because these animals do waste as well, and porcine dermatitis and nephropathy, nephropathy syndrome a vasculitis in pigs. And this wonderful picture by Bupinder Bawa from Kansas State University. And I will show you one more from Dr. David Dremeyer in South America. And this one shows the affected blood vessels and areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. And I can never say it enough. When we look at hemorrhage in the body, we are almost always looking at associated necrosis. Here's a picture of a five-week-old pig who is down on its side and paddling. And this is a very common presenting sign for one of the three bacteria that cause Glasser's disease, this one being Strepsuis. This is a young pig from Argentina, and we've talked about Glasser's disease or polycerositis causing vasculitis and exudation of plasma protein into potential spaces. The thorax, the abdomen, the pericardium, the joints, and here in the meninges. The meninges has a tremendous vascular bed, and infection by these three organisms Strepsuis type 2, Mycoplasma hyorhinus, and Ammophilus parasuis often results in a fibrinous or fibrinosuppurative meningitis. The ground glass appearance suggests the presence of fibrin here. Here's a pig from Thailand not so much fibrinous, but tremendous amounts of pus within the meninges. When I think of fibrinous or fibrinosuppurative meningitis in pigs, I think that Strepsuis and Haemophilus parasuis probably do this a little more often than Mycoplasma hyorhinus, which is the least of the three to affect the meninges. Something else that I would mention is that if you're looking at a meningitis or a meningoencephalitis and you're expecting fibrinosuppurative exudate and all you see is suppuration, not a shred of fibrin, don't discount strepsuis type 2 because it can often present with just neutrophilic inflammation with very little fibrin. We're looking at the underside. Look at the tremendous congestion that you see in these animals. The underside of the brain is a great place to look if you don't see anything on top when you open the skull because if you have pus, often gravity will cause it to pool along the basal nuclei at the lowest points of the skull here around the hypothalamus. In some 
portions of the world, about 30 to 40 percent of strep suis infections will have concomitant otitis media interna. So don't forget to look in the tympanic bulla in affected animals as well. It is also a potential space. This picture shows marked congestion and thrombosis of the meningeal vascular bed, but no fibrin, no pus. So don't sleep on the various septicemias that you might see in pigs, which will thrombose this large meningeal vascular bed. This one happens to be our old friend Salmonella cholera suis. Remember that host adapted strains of Salmonella, which would include Salmonella cholera suis and Salmonella typhi suis, manifest first as a sepsis before late in the course of the disease they cause the diarrhea we so often associate with Salmonella. Other septicemias that you may want to consider would be actinobacillosis, specifically actinobacillus suis, and other gram negatives, including E. coli in very young animals. If you look closely at this image, you will see an abscess. Here in the middle ear, And in this section of the spinal cord from Dr. Virginia Pierce, a large abscess in the spinal cord as well, which probably started out as osteomyelitis. From both of these lesions, Truparella pyogenes was isolated. Doesn't mean that it initially caused the lesion because Truparella pyogenes is a microaerophilic bacteria that likes to move into lesions that other bacteria have set up. It can cause lesions on its own, but because it is a normal commensal in the oral tract, respiratory tract, and it's very common in the environment of pigs. It often starts out as a contaminant and then becomes the agent that you invariably culture from lesions because it is so good in living in microaerophilic environments. Well, we have a real problem here. The water has frozen and the pigs are unable to get to water. So we need to talk about salt poisoning in pigs. Here is a pig that is demonstrating neurologic signs. While it is sitting down and might be confused with lesions affecting the spinal cord, this animal is also foaming at the mouth a little bit and has a very detached look about it. Salt poisoning comes in two forms, both direct and indirect. Direct salt poisoning comes with ingestion of excessive amounts of sodium chloride, and pigs will ingest a lot of salt naturally in their diet. Okay, You can give too much salt. Probably more common are indirect forms where the pig eats its natural diet, which might have up to 2% of salt in it, but does not have access to water for one reason or another. When the animal is finally given access to water, so much sodium has built up into the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid that the brain is flooded with water to try to dilute it out. And we get a characteristic laminar necrosis, which you can see multifocally here due to the tremendous edema and ultimately necrosis. One thing about this particular condition in pigs histologically, for unknown reasons, they often have an eosinophilic infiltrate within the areas of necrosis, which is very characteristic and almost diagnostic for this particular condition. As opposed to the laminar necrosis, 
which we see in ruminants due to polioencephalomalacia as a result of thiamine deficiency, high sulfur intake, or lead toxicity. Areas of laminar necrosis do not fluoresce in pigs because it is primarily simply edema rather than the extensive breakdown in myelin we see in ruminants with polioencephalomalacia. An additional lesion that you should look for in this nice transverse section by Dr. Jose Ramos Vera is cerebellar coning or cerebellar herniation through the foramen magnum, which we see when the rest of the brain undergoes swelling, edema, and pushes the cerebellum out through the back of the skull. Here is another pig who can't get up and is in a dog sitting position because its hind limbs are paralyzed, it is much more alert than the other one is aware of its surroundings. And this is a pig that exhibits bilateral poliomyelomalacia or hemorrhage and necrosis of the spinal gray matter due to an excessive administration of selenium. Remember, we have talked about mulberry heart disease and other diseases associated with selenium deficiency. And in selenium deficient areas, many farmers will give a little extra selenium. But as bad as selenium deficiency is, selenium toxicosis is just as bad and affected pigs will develop this bilaterally symmetric lesion in the ventral gray horns of the cervical and lumbar intumescences, which reminds me to tell you that bilaterally symmetrical lesions are not that common in veterinary pathology. And whenever you see it, you want to think of either a toxic cause or a nutritional deficiency. Infectious agents, viruses, bacteria, trauma, none of these give you bilaterally symmetric lesions. Only toxins and nutritional diseases. In addition to lesions in the spinal cord, in acute cases of uh, selenium toxicosis, and almost every case uh, in pigs is an acute case. They generally don't get the chronic lesions that we see in cattle and horses because they are not foraging and eating selenium containing plants. But these acute cases, you may also see cardiac and skeletal muscle and necrosis as well because high levels of selenium, even though it's normally an antioxidant, when you give it in very high levels, is a very potent oxidator and damages cellular membranes. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little trip through the nervous system of a pig and that you'll come back again to the Davis Thompson Foundation Facebook page or YouTube channel and we'll be able to talk about other aspects of gross and surgical pathology. Thanks for your attention. Have a great day.